Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to Functional Conf for 2022. Uh, we have with us uh, today uh, Luca uh, Magnani, uh, and he's going to talk on uh, uh, the topic familiarity or uh, guarantees of functional programming for the front end. So, uh, Luca, over to you. So, thank you, Vikram. Let me share my screen. Okay, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Luca Mugnani. I'm a software engineer at uh, Rakuten. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, how we transition from uh, um, regular like JavaScript uh, object oriented to uh, functional programming for some of our front end projects. So the story started uh, three years ago. The idea was to build a new registration and authentication system that provides a consistent experience without friction to all Rakuten users, regardless of the service they're using. We also wanted this system to be simple to be added to existing website because we have several hundred services and each service builds their own interface independently. We also wanted to allow a certain degree of customization. So in the past, we had some bad experience in maintaining projects. When they reach certain size, fixing something in one place would break the code in other places, making the experience of debugging or adding a new feature slow and stressful for developers. As John Carmack explained, the difficulty in understanding all the possible state of a system is the cause of a large quantity of flow. And it is also the reason why support center always has to reboot the system, right? So we want this new system to be reliable, simple to debug, and simple to be extended with new feature. So during our preliminary investigation about the front end stack, we came across Elm, which is a functional language that compiled to JavaScript. Elm was matching all our requirements, so we decided to give it a try and build a proof of concept with it. The first experience was very positive, as we were able to build a nice demo in a short time, even with limited knowledge of the language. What we liked about Elm were mainly the guarantees. <clears throat> no runtime errors, 100% immutable data, 100% pure function, and that all types are correct but at the same time, type annotation are completely optional. Also, Elm guarantees that there will be no surprises when upgrading dependency, thanks to the enforced semantic versioning system. Those characteristics also protect the project from the typical issues of NPM, the, the node packaging system. Another aspect that was important for us was that Elm combined together a lot of different tools that otherwise need to be selected individually. These helps to cut short endless discussion about which tool is the best and makes all Elm projects resembling each other. So it becomes easier to move from one project to another. Also it makes simple to set up the development environment. Also, Elm could target other languages other than JavaScript. There are, for example, experimental effort to target the WebAssembly. And this seems like a nice feature as we may be able to start using WebAssembly or other languages without much effort in the future. Another thing that we liked was the Elm UI library. It is a semantic layer above CSS that lets you write complex layouts in a very intuitive way. Here, for example, to center something horizontally and vertically inside an HTML element, we just need to specify center X and center Y. If you have to do the same in CSS, I would probably need to Google it because I just don't remember it. This is probably what I personally like the most about functional programming. The order of instruction doesn't matter. With an imperative language, if you use a variable that is not defined, like B in the second row, that is only defined in the third row, you get an error. The exact same code written in a functional language just works, regardless of the order of instructions. This has several nice consequences. For example, you can move your code around without problems. That is very useful during uh, refactoring. Another thing that I would like to highlight 
is the stuff that is not in Elm. For example, the any type that basically shut off the type system in TypeScript, adding vulnerabilities, does not exist in Elm. Null and undefined also do not exist. And the same for try catch blocks because errors are handled directly by the time system and so on. So this makes Elm a small and a simple language. Also related to the compiler, in Elm there are no escape hatches. This means that guarantees do not depend on the discipline of the team members. Moreover, the compiler's friendly error and the concept that if it compiles, it works, give the impression that the compiler itself is like an assistant that is looking over your shoulder and guiding you while coding. This is an example of an error message in Elm. By mistake, we pass the number to a function that instead uh, expects a string. The resulting error is very precise. It highlights the problem, the exact position of the problem, and it gives also in green a possible resolution. Especially when moving from a dynamic language like JavaScript to a statically typed language, it may feel that types are slowing you down. Those friendly error messages help to mitigate this issue. Also, we evaluated the differences between TypeScript and Elm as there were some opinion that TypeScript would have been good enough for what we had in mind. Recently, actually, I wrote an article about this investigation. You can find it in dev.to. In short, the main difference is that the TypeScript cannot bring the same guarantees that Elm does. TypeScript objective was not to be sound since its inception. And th this decision was probably made this to allow TypeScript to remain a superset of JavaScript. Being sound means that the, the type checker can detect at compile time every single error that may happen at the runtime. Elm instead is based on the sound Hindley Milner type system. The other difference is that the TypeScript is familiar for a developer that already know JavaScript why Elm is not, as it used the ML syntax. So at the end of our investigation, three years ago, we were faced with this decision. Do we, took the red, do we take the red pill and move away from JavaScript, embracing a new language and a new paradigm? Or do we take the blue pill and remain in a world familiar to JavaScript? choosing one of the mainstream frameworks. In short, do we choose guarantees or familiarity? Well, somehow we didn't agree with the idea that if something is popular, it must be good. And we were excited about the innovative and disrupted ideas of Elm. So we took the red pill. Fast forward three years and uh, about uh, our new registration authentication service, we had around 30 releases, one every month and a half with around 15 features implemented in each release. We are very satisfied with the level of maintainability. That was our main initial goal. Our code base now has uh, 70,000 lines of Elm code and 2,000 lines of TypeScript code. We had no blockers and uh, basically zero issue related to the Elm code but a few issues related to the TypeScript code, which is around 3% of our code base. So Elm has been proven to be a resilient technology. Moreover, we successfully hired and trained uh, several developers. We didn't use Elm only for the registration and authentication system, but for other projects as well, from static pages to internal projects, open source project and so on. Some of those projects are generated server side, so they also work without uh, JavaScript. Hiring was one of the concern that we had at the beginning, but we also heard that the uh, companies that adopted Elm were not having any issue with it, but quite the opposite. After three years, we can confirm this. We get application from passionate engineers that want to join our team just because we use Elm. And in any case, Elm is simple to learn and safe to write. 
it's also used as, as a training language for children and teenagers by some school. So onboarding new developers is a smooth process and they're usually able to learn Elm and work in production in a matter of weeks. Regarding instead what happened to the language in those last three years, the Elm ecosystem got better and larger with new tools and new library. Elm also inspired other systems to a different extent, for example, ZwiftUI, Redux, Scala, and the Rust. At the moment, there are still no valid alternative to Elm with similar guarantees. There are some alternatives like a pure script or rescript with different set of guarantees. And uh, as uh, Richard Feldman nicely put it this morning, of course, with different ergonomics. We noted that all, often Elm is recommended as a gateway drag that lead to functional programming, thanks to its design principle of being a beginner friendly. A recent nice addition to the Elm ecosystem is Elm Review. Uh, this is a powerful static code analyzer that not only warn you about issues in your code, but it goes there and fix those for you. And it also remove code that is not necessary. So what you see here, it's a, a typical reaction after running Elm Review for the first time on a large code base. It is like having an automatic pull request reviewers. So we added it in all our pipelines. The Elm ecosystem is quite comprehensive nowadays. There are, th these are some of the most interesting uh, and uh, popular libraries. Stuff like Elm Spa to create single page application, Elm Chart for nice visualization of data, Elm Pages for a static generated website and so on. A small curiosity, uh, this chart is from the state of JavaScript, uh, an online survey that run every year about uh, the JavaScript ecosystem. It is far from being scientific or reflecting the real state of JavaScript ecosystem, but it's still fun to check the results. These are the most dreamed feature of JavaScript. And I realized that at least five of them are implemented already in Elm. Other people actually argue that they, that all of them are in a way or another uh, already supported by Elm. So it is nice to see that ideas from the functional world are becoming desired feature in a mainstream language. So I'm, I'm looking forward for the time when you know, all of these are implemented and we can write functional code directly in JavaScript. And at that point, Elm, Elm will be like the new jQuery. So at, <clears throat> at work, we are running regular internal workshop right now. And as a consequence, we created some training material that we made available to everybody. This is, for example, a demo built for our workshop. It is an e-commerce application made of only 2,500 lines of Elm code, and it collects our best practices. It can be used as a learning tool or as a, as a bootstrap for new Elm application. This is a, a chat sheet that contains everything that you need to know about Elm, including advanced stuff. And it was nice to realize that it all fit easily in one page. After all this time spent using uh, or maintaining and teaching Elm, we came out with some internal uh, best practice. And be explicit is probably the most important. We spend more time reading code than writing it. So we don't want uh, our colleagues having this reaction when they read our code or even worse, ourselves when we read our own code months later. So we try to follow the manifesto, write junior code. In our team, we don't have any member with a formal education in functional programming or category theory. So we all enjoy reading like simple and idiomatic code. Following, I will give you some example. If you don't know Elm or the ML syntax, those examples may not be clear for you, but I, I hope you can get some idea out of them. Also, some of the following points may be a bit controversial, but bear with me. About idiomatic Elm, we prefer uh, among these two examples, the one on the right with the case of structure. 
it has less stuff inside in, in green color, they need to be remembered compared to the other one in yellow that has more stuff in it. We try to avoid point freestyle as it is hiding some information. I'm cheating a bit here because if you add the type annotation, it would be more readable, but still just to, to make the point. Also in this case, using pipe operator instead of the function composition operator, it makes the code more explicit. Okay, so the overall experience have been extremely positive. We were able to implement many features quickly with basically zero issue. <clears throat> but I want to briefly talk about another aspect that for us as a developer is equally important, if not more important, the developer experience. This is an interesting tweet that I have uh, seen recently. A good measure of a language quality is how much trouble can I get myself in? Let's try to evaluate a language from this perspective. Here I listed some question that we usually ask ourselves when writing the code in a dynamic imperative language. Those are important questions that we need to answer carefully if you want to write good quality code. For example, can I move this piece of code? Uh, should I wrap this in a try catch block? Can I trust this library? Should I check if this method exists? before using it or can I remove this function is there like any edge case that I forgot to consider and so on it is a lot of stuff to think about and to be worried about when moving to a purely functional language all those questions are automatically answered by the system for example can I move this piece of code sure should I wrap this in a try catch block no, doesn't, the concept doesn't even exist. Can I trust the lab, this library? Yes, because uh, libraries cannot have their own side effects. Should I check if this method exists? No, because if the code compiles, it works. Can I remove this function? Again, if it compiles without it, yeah, you can remove it. Is there any edge case that I forgot to consider? No, because the compiler already forced you to consider them all, and so on. So when using a purely functional language, those questions all disappear. And this gives us a peace of mind and a lot of extra time to care about what we value the most, like uh, implementing important feature or caring about UX, usability, and so on. This is what we call it a stress-free developer experience. If you're interested in this concept, have a look at this uh, nice presentation, Pragmatic Functional Programming by Richard Feldman. He does a, uh, a much better job in explaining than, than me. Um, about the future. So we plan to expand the use of Elm and reduce the use of other languages whenever possible, as we would like to have all our code to be covered by the Elm guarantees. Also, we will keep contributing to the growth of the Elm ecosystem and uh, follow new progress down to the compiler and the core libraries. At the same time, we will keep our eyes on promising emerging technology. I listed here some of them like REN, Rescript, Dev, Rock. Maybe Rock is more on the back end. Anyway, etc. So, if you would like to evaluate Elm as a possible option for a future front-end project, here is uh, some tip for you. Watch some video or other material made by Evan Chaplicki, the creator of the language, Richard Feldman mentioned earlier, or others. There is a lot of nice stuff out there. Join the very friendly Elm community in Slack. You can find it just Googling Elm, Elm Slack. Ask someone that already use it or build some simple application with it. Also tomorrow, there will be another talk about Elm at this conference by Graham Dixon, talking about railway oriented programming. So while we are wrapping this up, what are the takeaway that I would like you all to live with? First of all, let's appreciate how lucky we are as we are living in a moment where it's possible to do front-end with a pure functional language. 
And second, let's challenge the front-end status quo, prioritizing the developer experience and makes our life better. So this is all, thank you very much. Hey, Luca, thank you. That was a wonderful session. Um, we have some questions uh, on the uh, Q&A tab. Uh, you can look at it and then probably answer them. Um, yeah, so why the, the first question is, why is TypeScript uh, uh, still required in your code base? So there are certain things that uh, they need to be done outside Elm because um, um, <clears throat> certain, certain communication with certain API of the browser, for example, need to be done outside. For example, if you wanna uh, use the local storage, this is done outside um, outside Elm. Um, so this is a, a one reason. Local storage will be four lines of, of JavaScript code. So that is not the, the big part. The bigger part that we have some library um, that we need to use in JavaScript and we never took the time to convert in, uh, um, in Elm. So this is the largest part of our TypeScript code. Um, second question. What language is your backend written in? Do you try to get uh, guarantees over the API front-end interface, for example, by sharing the data types used by the backend and the front-end? Okay, so um, we tend to have uh, a lot of Java in our company, and we are try trying now slowly to transition to front uh, to functional programming also there. But uh, it's a uh, it's very hard for social reason also and cultural reason i'm not going to talk in detail so but what we were able to do is at least to use kotlin so our backend now is in kotlin and the, the way we do uh, this um, uh, communication is we use a swagger and um, so the, the backend is providing a swagger file to us as a front end and uh, with that, the, we generate automatically, there is a tool that uh, it takes the Swagger file that uh, describe all the API and they generate Elm code. The interesting thing is that uh, the backend, even though they uh, maintain the Swagger file, they don't use it to generate their own code. So many times the communication doesn't work because they, um, they don't reflect the modification into their own code. So, they use the front end to debug uh, basically the, the back end. Um, is Elm able to position popovers based on the mouse click coordinate? Yes, it does. Uh, there are, uh, this is a, can be done completely in, in Elm. There are some function that will tell you the coordinate of any element in the DOM. So you can use those to, to do those kind of uh, uh, trick. Does Elm have a native rich text editor widget component now? Um, <clears throat> there is, a, I believe there is, there are several actually rich text editor. Um, I don't know how much they are complete. Um, uh, we don't use them, so I, I cannot go more than, I cannot answer more than this. I, I know there are some. And the, the other option would be to instead use uh, like a third uh, library, uh, third party library and in, in inject into Elm as a web component. JavaScript has a lot of library and a huge active community. How do you feel about the adoption of Elm by a larger community in the year to come? Um, so yeah, this is, um, I, I don't know the answer. Um, I would say Elm will, can I say the goal of Elm is not to become mainstream. I don't think Elm will ever be a mainstream. I think uh, Elm is good like uh, uh, for company who like this idea of uh, the functional approach. It's, a, it's, a, it's very good and uh, there are no um, problem with it. Um, but uh, for the for the mainstream stuff, maybe it's more about uh, influencing the direction of JavaScript rather than, you know, becoming uh, a, a mainstream language. 
Um, can we trust pure code not to misbehave, for example, any possibility of runtime errors such as divide by zero environment issue, et cetera? And if so, how to address them in pure code? I, I would say, uh, yes, we can trust, uh, basically, especially for a normal application, like, like what we do, like a web single page application. It, it, we never have issues. Um, Still, for example, if you divide by zero, uh, you will get uh, uh, an error in, in Elm. What you can do, uh, th there is a library, but it was one line of code. What you can do is that uh, you can create a safe uh, division operator that uh, instead of returning a number, return maybe a number. And you can also avoid that problem uh, about dividing by zero. So you have this wrapper and then you check if it's a, uh, at zero then return nothing and if there is not zero you do, you do the division but we don't even do that it's a um in in general we don't have issue so i, I guess we can trust how do you handle uh, an elm package that is not compatible with a specific elm version uh, elm calendar one zero not compatible with elm 19 one um yeah so um between 0.19 and 0.19.1, I think uh, there was no uh, problem. There was no need to update the uh, dependency. There was a need to update dependency between 0.18 to 0.19. Um, so first of all, um, Elm, maybe, I don't know if you know, but it, it's, uh, it's very slow in updating. So recently every release happened like every two years. Um, and uh, when that happened, for example, from 018 to 019, all the library need to be uh, updated. So usually you wait one or two months and all the major library get updated. And then you also move your code into the new release. If a library don't get updated, it, maybe you can, you can just take it and update it yourself. Usually the update is not, uh, is not a big uh, issue. Um, does it support a hybrid mobile app implementation? Um, not sure what a hybrid mobile app implementation is. Um, there is no specific tool to, to create a native uh, uh, mobile application. Um, you can easily build a, a PWA, progressive web application, or you can have the, your uh, Elm application running in a web view, for example, in an app. This is what we do reg on a regular basis. How do you feel about the future of Elm? Oh, I feel uh, very good. Um, it's um, it's still like you know not so popular, but uh, it's um, the community is, is really like. Um, uh, active. There are a lot of movement, especially in the um, packaging and external library modules and so on. And um, the creator of Elm, it's uh, it's working on, on Elm uh, regularly, and uh, they, we we know actually what is working right now. He he gave us some uh, idea what is working on. The things is uh, he uh, he's not so active on the social media, so. Um, if you don't know what's going on in Elm, you may feel like uh, is anybody like really working on the core of the of the of the language. Also, keep in mind that uh, uh, the language as itself is basically done. The, the author itself uh, he keeps saying, if you like what you see, it's what you will get for the next several years. So don't ask, so if you if you want to use Elm don't expect to have like a new version like every month or every six months. As I told you, the last release was now more than two years ago. And, and the, the large modification was more than four years ago, I think five years or six years ago. So it's very stable language. So you have to enjoy the language itself, uh, not the fact that it's, there is no like a list of uh, new feature in the backlog that all we are waiting to be implemented. Uh, the, the language is, 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 is basically done. Okay, uh, Luca, I think uh, yep. we have sort of reached our uh, time. Uh, so thank you very much for your talk.